All right, Fantasy Football Nation, welcome back to the channel. Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. As always, it's your boy, Nick. We just had the news of the Zeke suspension dropping, so I had to get this out to y'all quickly as possible, because I know some of y'all are driving today, tomorrow, maybe Sunday. Whatever the situation is, it's a huge impact on the fantasy landscape. So I gotta dive into this full steam, and this news literally just dropped like an hour ago, so I'm kind of going to be on the, uh, sorry. So you got to bear with me here because I'm pulling up stats as we speak, as I'm doing this video. So this is what we know right now. He got a six-game suspension. The team has a bye during week six, so he'll miss five games, weeks one through five. Team bye will miss week seven. That's the sixth game. Then he'll return week eight against Washington. I, don't, I have no idea how the appeal system really works, but this is quote, quote unquote from Roto World. It's a standard benchmark for domestic violence infractions in six games. Elliot now has three days to file an appeal, which will likely happen, and then the league would then have 10 days to schedule a hearing on that appeal. This thing could go a number of different directions, and it's possible it may drag out for months. Elliot would be able to play during his appeal process. For now, we simply have to take the stance that he's going to be out for the Cowboys' first six games, which would have him returning week eight, Dallas buys week six, against the Redskins. So I'm definitely doing this analysis as if he's missing those six games. It's very possible that the appeal takes long and it goes into the season so he gets to play, but we'll look at it from the six game suspension. Who is the Dallas running back to own? How valuable is he? Where should you draft his backup? What kind of uses can we expect? And you know, we have to look at the first six weeks or the first six games of Dallas schedule and you know, how tough it is. And then who else can we look at besides uh, just the Dallas running back if you are going to fill in spots for Zeke, right? Who else is a good late round pick to fill in for those first six games? Where is Zeke's ADP going to drop to? Where are you comfortable drafting him? Where am I comfortable drafting him? Where is the backup for Dallas's running back? You know, where's his ADP? Where where should you draft him? And lastly, we got to talk about, you know, the impact of, of Zeke's suspension on Dallas as a whole as the team. Mainly just Dez and Dak because, I, like, I'm not drafting anyone else on the team. Possibly Cole Beasley and, like, PPR later, but we'll get to that. Let's get into it. So the first thing you gotta ask yourself, right, if he's out for, if he's out until week eight. Most fantasy leagues start their playoffs in week 14, usually 15, so 15, 16. So you're getting week eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, possibly 14, so seven games. He's missing half the season. You gotta ask yourself, where are you comfortable drafting someone that you're getting for seven weeks and hopefully the playoffs? I think it takes a, a whole number of things into in consideration. You know, are there worthy backups to draft while you're waiting? How big is your bench? You know, if you only have like three or four spots on the bench, you don't wanna carry a guy for eight weeks because you need those. What kind of scoring are you in? You know, standard versus PPR, because obviously he's not a huge pass catcher, but let's break down the depth chart. Right now we know it's Zeke, Walk DMC, Darren McFadden's the number two guy, and then you have a combination of like Rod Smith and Alfred Morris. Now Rod Smith is listed as like a fullback running back. He was initially listed above Alfred Morris on the depth chart. Alfred Morris did well in their first preseason game, the Hall of Fame game. He ran for like 42 yards on seven carries. So he looked good. So I'm assuming he's gonna jump up to the number three, I guess the number two behind McFadden now. And you know, on the eye test level, Morris outplayed McFadden. McFadden ran the ball three times for negative six yards. Neither of them had a target, so neither of them were really involved in the passing game. So I'm going to assume Darren McFadden's gonna be the guy for this Dallas backfield. We saw it in 2015, how they ended the season, and he was already listed as their guy in the depth chart. They're probably comfortable with him. He's been there for a little while now, so they're comfortable with him on all three downs. He knows the playbook very well. He's just, he's a stable part of that offense for the coaching staff. So let's look at the usage rates of, of Dallas, right? Here's a really good tweet from Michael Clay this morning, comparing Zeke's usage rate to McFadden's in 2015. Gotta remember, 2015 going into the season, you had like a big camp battle between Joseph Randall, Darren McFadden. Randall, he won that competition, started from weeks one to five. He was like their workhorse. And then McFadden took over after the week six by from week seven to week 17. This is what we're looking at here. We see the usage rates almost identical. 76% carry share for running backs on the team, nine to 11% target share. So when you're looking at the RB1 in Dallas, you know that they like to feed one guy primarily, especially on early downs on goal line. Not so much in the, in the passing work, but McFadden is definitely an upgrade to Morris in terms of pass catching. So there's 
a strong possibility his target share might go up a little bit when in 2015 you had Lance Dunbar also on the roster. So there were other running backs getting targets there for DMC this year. There's no one else on the roster that really scares you away from the passing work. Now, what you could say about McFadden is, I mean, you look back at 2014 also, right? That was the year that DeMarco Murray had like 4,000 touches. So you see a clear trend here. They love to use the running back. Their running back one is a clear workhorse. You could look at, at that stretch for, for McFadden, right? From week seven to 17 when he took over. I think, in my opinion, two different ways. From week seven to 17, right? McFadden averaged 21 touches a game, but he only scored twice, only two touchdowns. That's not good considering that workload, right? Over 11 game span, you're touching the ball 21 times a game, only scored twice. He had six rushes inside the five yard line. And in uh, Joseph Randall's five games in the beginning of the season, he had four. So you're getting a total of 10 rushes inside the five from the running backs as a whole because no one else had a rush inside that part of the field. So that's 10 for the year. I look back at 2014, DeMarco had 12 rushes inside the five. Last year, Zeke only had 11. So you're seeing a trend. It's not a huge amount of opportunity for the running back inside the goal line. So I'm thinking like, why, for a team that runs the ball so much, you know, why Why don't the running backs as their workhorses get more opportunity? So I'm like, maybe they pass the ball a ton down there. Then I looked at the quarterback situations. In 2014, they had Romo, attempted a total of 25 passes inside the 10. It was him and um, Brandon Whedon, because he played like one or two games. 25 total inside the 10. In 2015, they had a combination of quarterbacks. They had 28 pass attempts inside the 10. And then last year, Dak had 24 inside the 10 yard line. Those are not high, that's not a lot of passing volume inside the 10 yard line for quarterback. So they don't have a lot of rushing opportunity and they don't have a lot of passing opportunity. I'll touch on this a little later in the video, but you look at Darren McFadden compared to DeMarco, compared to Zeke. Like I said, DeMarco didn't have a lot of touches inside the five, neither did Zeke. But both running backs, Zeke was able to score 15 rushing, rushing touchdowns. DeMarco Murray was able to score 13. So what does that tell you? That they're capable of bigger plays. Not all of their touchdowns have to come from within the five. They don't need to depend on goal line touches. Now, when DeMarco, I mean, when McFadden has six carries inside the 10, which is like, you know, half the amount that the other two had, but he's only putting up a fraction of the number of touchdowns. Both of his touchdowns came from within the five. I think that tells you that McFadden doesn't really have that type of ability that Zeke has and that Murray had in that 2014 season to bust out the bigger runs. Like Zeke having only 10 rushes inside, or 11 rushes inside the five, but scoring 15 rushing touchdowns tell you that he's able to score from the goal line, but he's also able to score from, you know, the 15, the 20, the 30, the 40, when I'm not sure if McFadden at this age gives you that capability. So I do think it's a downgrade to McFadden in that sense. And what else this tells you about the Dallas offense is they're just so efficient when they're doing it. And that is a huge piece of it is that offensive line. They lose Ronald Leary, signed a four year, like $35 million deal with the Broncos. And you have Doug Free who retires. So you lose your left guard, your right tackle. Now, neither of those, those two were not like, the, they were probably the bottom two guys on their line, right? Not even, not arguable there, but I say this on my channel a lot. Continuity makes a big difference when you're talking about an offensive line, right? These guys who've played together, they know exactly where they should be blocking, who they should be blocking, and it and it creates like a good momentum going forward. These two guys are out of the picture now, um, and they go from one of the top ranked lines, and they're still good. They're still top 10 according to Pro Football Focus, but it is a little bit of a, of a fallback compared to what Darren McFadden, now Darren McFadden was basically running behind the elite line in 2015. What also kind of makes me a little nervous about McFadden is you look at Zeke and you look at DeMarco and you know that those two guys are like top talent running backs, right? There's no real question about how good they are as players. And that's, that's why I would say they got their They'll, their bulk of the work, right? They got so many touches as, as the RB1 there. McFadden, I'm worried that he only saw that number of touches because Tony Romo was hurt. And they had to use a combination of Brandon Whedon, Matt Castle, Kellen Moore, and like really, really bad quarterbacks. So it made sense for them to have to lean on the run, right? Because you look at Tony Romo was playing in the beginning of the season, a majority of the games that Joseph Randall was there. And compared to DMC's 21 touches a game towards the end of the year with the shitty quarterbacks, Randall was averaging around 17 to 18 touches a game, so three or four touches less. Not a huge drop off, still great as a, as a value play in fantasy, but it is noticeable. And now, of course, you want to compare like a Tony Roman to Dak. I'm saying that they're both very, very competent, if not above average quarterback. So you're not having a guy like Cal Moore behind center where you need to rely on the run game heavily. Maybe they give Dak more room to operate this year. So it's hard to imagine DMC taking over as a full workhorse here in Dallas. Holy shit balls. The Bills just traded Sammy Watkins. Whoa, holy. Wait, the Bills traded for cornerback EJ Gaines and the Rams second round pick for Sammy Watkins and the Bills six rounder. Buffalo also traded for wide receiver Jordan Matthews and a third rounder for 
cornerback Ronald Darby. Holy balls. I have to get that into that in another another video, not right now. Oh my goodness. Fuck dog. Good move by the Rams, right? After signing Robert Woods to a huge contract, they Sammy Watkins. Good front office moves. All right, anyways, back to Jesus Christ, can't focus. Back to uh, Zeke and Run DMC. So what I would say for Run DMC is he's definitely gonna get a lion's share of the workload. There's still gonna be a run first team, but I do think they give the keys to Dak a little more. I'd expect maybe 15 to 18 touches a game in that range. So then you wanna take a look at the schedule and here's a little chart I have. So you look at their first six weeks. Four of their matchups are really tough. The Giants, first of all, you're at Denver. Now Denver's scarier on paper, like in theory, against the run than they actually are. They weren't that good last year, and they're missing Shane Ray and Shaq Barrett, some of their key linebackers. And then they go to Arizona, Los Angeles Rams, Green Bay, who was terrible on pass, but good against the run. And then they finish off San Fran. So four out of the six matchups are gonna be very tough for whoever is the running back there. Like I said, I'm assuming it's DMC. So I also think they pull back on the reins a little bit from the running back position as a whole, the downgrade to the line a little bit. Also with Dak stepping up as, as a leader, they're gonna give him the keys a little bit more, I believe. So DMC I'd see somewhere probably from like 15 to 18 touches. You can't think he's gonna be the full bell cow there. I would say Alfred Smith is gonna, I mean, uh, Alfred Smith, Alfred Morris is gonna get touches. Rod Smith looked like a pretty good pass catcher there as well in the preseason game. He caught uh, three balls for 25 yards. I know it was against scrub defenses, but the matchups along with along with the rest of this stuff makes me kind of pull the reins back on, on DMC a little bit. I would say he's a mid RB2 right now for those first six games. In a 10 team league, I'm not going to draft McFadden until probably the seventh round. Just off the top of my head. There's just so much talent on the board up until rounds five, six. Seven is probably where I'd start debating him between guys like McFadden and maybe like a Mark Ingram. Let me pull up some ADPs right quick. So yeah, around seven is when you start getting into the Spencer Wares, Mark Ingram, CJ Anderson, Tevin Coleman, Danny Woodhead. So I'm taking guys like Spencer Ware, CJ Anderson ahead of him, guys that have a good chance of being the guy in their offense. Coleman versus McFadden is actually a very good debate. Thing is, when Zeke gets back, McFadden or the RB2 basically has zero value in that offense. So you're only getting him for the first few weeks. So yeah, I would say seventh round or later is where I would really start looking to McFadden. And that's in 10 team league, so adjust accordingly to you. And I go from there because, like I said, you know, it is uncertainty. That was back in 2015. It was shitty quarterback, so you know the workload was there because they needed to run the ball. I'm not reaching into like the fifth round for McFadden when he has no value over the second half of the year into the playoff. And it is still a question mark because Joseph Randall did beat him out. If he wasn't like a fucking psycho and started shoplifting and doing all this crazy legal shit, he may have came back as, as you know, as the guy there for Dallas for the rest of the year, not McFadden. So when we talk about Zeke, where are you comfortable drafting him? Like I said, it comes down to how big your bench is, how comfortable are you having. He's going to come back and be the workhorse here. There's no doubt in my mind. And the crazy part about it is if he, if he is sitting for those first eight weeks, right, there's a good chance that they feed the shit out of him when he comes back, right? He's gonna have fresh, fresh, fresh legs to go for like a solid seven games straight. Think of like Le'Veon Bell numbers last year when he had 28 touches. Now he's not gonna get the reception totals, but I could easily see Zeke getting 25 carries a game when he does come back. So if Zeke drops anywhere into the fourth round, you're taking him, I would be debating him at the end of the third. And what I do like as well is if you have the number one or two pick, you know, you're gonna get a Le'Veon Bell or David Johnson. Now, when you come back around that other turn where it's 19, 20, 21, 22, Zeke is probably going to be sitting there. And it's hard to pass up a David Johnson, Le'Veon Bell, a Zeke combo for the second half of your season going into the playoffs. So it, it's kind of a weird combo for me. Now, I would like him at that turn if I got David Johnson and Le'Veon Bell together, but I'm not sure I like him in between that and the end of the third round. So I don't know if that really makes sense to you guys, but I would say late third round, into the fourth round is when I would definitely start looking at Zeke. Cause you gotta remember like in the first half of the year, there are other guys that will be out, you know, Doug Martin. So there's other options to go for that you could fend off Zeke sitting on your bench. If he drops, I would say late late third, early fourth is definitely, I, that's where his ADP I think will settle. Maybe in like 22 to 25 range. I think that's a little early unless you can get one of those top RBs, then you could pair them two together. I think that's a crazy combination. So that's kind of where I'm at on Zeke. Now in terms of alternative options, I think this is where where like a strength of schedule kind of thing would come into play. So you have Jacquez Rogers. Doug Martin out for the first few games. Quiz starts off the season as a starter, for sure, against the Dolphins, Bears, Vikings. Dolphins, worst rush defense in the NFL last year, 4.8 yards per carry. 
Bears, 4.4 yards per carry. Vikings, 4.2. So all in the bottom half of the NFL in terms of rushing defense. So Quiz is a great pick right now. He's going off at 150 overall, running back 43. And then you look at a guy like Terrence West, still, still, you know, even with the Kenneth Dixon news, still going past pick 115 as like RB30 or RB, RB36. And, you know, he's a clear-cut early down back there. I know Danny Wood is going to get a lot of passing work, but we saw Terrence West look really good in their first preseason game. Got in there for a touchdown, 35 rushing yards on like five or six carries. You look at their first few matchups. They get the Bengals, bottom 10 in rush defense. You get the Browns, bottom five and bottom four in rush defense. Jaguars is a tough matchup. And you get the Steelers, bottom half rush defense. Raiders, bottom six rush defense. Bears again, bottom nine defense. Vikings, bottom half again. So he starts off with a really easy run schedule. Terrence West is a guy who could dominate over the first half, first six weeks of the season. And I think he's a great play because both of these guys you can get after pick 100. Maybe draft one less wide receiver, maybe draft one more mid to late round running back. And then you look at a guy like Fat Rob Kelly, right? After this first week's preseason game, we saw P. Ryan miss a block. Uh, drop a pass, fumble a ball. Kelly's clearly the RB1 here, right? You look at his, his first five or six matchups, Eagles, Rams, Raiders, Chiefs, 49ers, Eagles again. Besides the Rams, all the other five games are against teams that were in the bottom half against rushing defense. Still going 125 overall, RB40. I'm sure that will raise up a little bit after this first week of preseason, but you get the point. Those are already guys that I liked as mid, or as late round uh, running backs that could start the season off on a bang, or at least fill in for guys like Doug Martin or a guy like Zeke now with the suspension. So look at those guys if you're gonna draft Zeke. So if you do that, you know, you could always draft Zeke and then reach a round or two above those guys' regular ADP so that you know you'll have them on your team. And then you'll have Zeke for the rest of the, the season. What it does for the offense, like I said, I think it opens things up for Dak a little more. I think he, he passes the ball a little more. A little bit of a boost to Dez. He's not a high volume catcher, but the targets, I guess, would have to go up. I think it gives a small boost to a guy like Terrence Williams or Cole Beasley, but nothing crazy because when I look back at their stats at the second half of 2015, they didn't really see that many more opportunities. They didn't see more targets or anything. Very well could be that the quarterback play was shitty, but, but overall, I don't think it changed. I don't think it's a huge outlook change for the rest of the weapons on the team because the way that the Dallas kind of just fills in one running back for another, they have a good old line. It's like efficient, so it's not that hard to fill in the spot. So obviously, Zeke's much more talented, so he'll probably move the chains more than a McFadden would but overall in terms of how they're going to run their offense I doubt it really changes that much so that's my take on Zeke very quickly I'm sure shit will change super rapidly and more good articles and and stats will come out as the year goes by I mean as the preseason goes by but so that's that give that video a thumbs up if it helped you at all subscribe to the channel if you're new I'll see you all in the next episode